good evening. Let's all stand together, grab your hymnals, turn to page 415. We'll sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, page 415. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arm. Page 517, I am resolved. <coughs> Page 517. I am resolved no longer to linger, torn by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, have a Lord my side. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. Just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. As of sin, friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful to be in your house. Lord, I do ask that you would please bless this service. Lord, I ask that uh, you be with our hearts this evening. Allow us to be soft and tender. 
receptive to your word. I ask that the Holy Spirit would bring conviction. Lord, that you would change us to be more like you. Lord, I ask that we would worship you in our singing, Lord, in our attitudes, and our fellowship. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you would like to grab that missionary letter out that you grabbed when you came in. So I was told that we might have a repeat on our hands. And if so, I apologize. But who noticed that Pastor did a repeat last week? Anyone? Okay, so if you, you didn't notice that, you won't notice this. So it'd be fun. Um, no, so I do want to mention, before we go to the missionary letter, uh, we did start doing the prayer list, a prayer request that you can submit online through the app. And so, uh, as a reminder, if you want to hop on the app real quick and submit your prayer request for this evening to get put on the prayer list at the end of the service, uh, we'll be sure to get that. If for some reason you don't have, don't have the app on your phone, you need help, uh, by all means, come see me. Uh, if you're like, I hate technology, I'm never getting a phone, then we have paper in the back still, so we're still okay. But um, So if you want to do that so we can get all those requests on, that's a big help. And honestly, if you want to do that throughout the day, we had probably three or four requests come in um, before service time, and that helps us because then we can even get things uh, more ready for, uh, so we're not trying to do it during service, which is, which is beneficial. All right, let's start with the Pattersons. This is the one that I was told is the potential repeat. And so we'll go through and read, th read this, and then I would like to mention a couple of things about uh, Brother Patterson. It says, Welcome to class. Please do not worry about the lack of air conditioning, as the high today here in St. Louis, in Mexico, will be in the 70s. Uh, our 12 students may seem very few, but their work one day may change entire nations. Uh, they are the hope for the future. Uh, Bible translations for, they are, the, they are the hope for future Bible translations for groups that have never held God's precious word. Watch their faces as they suddenly understand the biblical principle involved in reliably translating the Bible. It says, former students from our class are in faraway lands, carefully working with native helpers, giving God's word to those who once were perishing in sin. Uh, if you were there, you would see yet again how... The light of the scripture opens their understanding as their eyes shine brightly. For 10 weeks every year, the Lord allows us to help train Bible translators. For eight years now, one-fifth of our time is invested in training and mentoring others to do what we have done. Please keep our students in your prayers. Uh, are there sacrifices to be made? Well, our three children are gathering in Washington, D.C. this next week. Uh, and this was a while ago. This was back in August. It says, our two younger children... We'll meet their niece, Coco, for the first time. Our two sons-in-law, Joe and Jared, uh, will enjoy going on coffee and photo, photo adventures with the group. Uh, we will be 3,500 miles away, happy that they can celebrate Ryan and Trisha's birthdays during this time. Yet, we miss them. And wish we could be in two places at once. There is no doubt in our minds God, serving God is worth any sacrifice. As we close this letter, I humbly request your prayers for the Bethesda Children's Homes. We are still short-staffed under finance and in need of several miracles. In only two weeks, uh, we will receive an, an, ex, an expected 130 children. Our trust in the Lord has not wavered, and he has given us complete peace. We eagerly await a miracle. Now, if you remember, Pastor showed a couple of pictures. Um, was it Sunday, maybe? Uh, recently. Um, of the children's home down in Mexico. Uh, it w Hannah, was it two days later or I mean, two weeks later, one week later? So they had officially finished this building, this brand new building, got it all ready for this, this children's ministry in this children's home. And then uh, I think, was it Helene that did it? Helene came through and completely wiped it out, completely gone. Um, and so... They're trusting by faith that God provides a way that they can rebuild that, but it's it's just it's heart, it's disheartening, obviously. And so, uh, Pastor did mention that we are going to be doing our harvest um, harvest gift. What do we call it? Harvest offering, the, where we do a special project um, for a missionary around Christmas time. Um, and this year, we're going to do it for that children's home in Mexico uh, for the Pattersons. And so. Uh, something to be praying about there. And then uh, Hannah had just mentioned to me that um, Bill Patterson's mom actually coded last night, and uh, they had to bring her back. Um, they were able to, 
I don't know any other details, but uh, let's be in prayer, obviously, for, for him and his mom during that hard, hard time, obviously. Is, is he currently in Mongolia? Yeah, so he, I mean, he's on the other side of the world and he can't be with her, obviously, so pray for that. All right, let's turn over to the White family in the Philippines. It says, this month has been a lot of preaching and teaching, especially in the school. I teach three different Bible classes, three days a week, four hours a day, to two different classrooms, two that are grade five and two that are grade six. Uh, on Tuesday, we study the book of Genesis. On Wednesday, the life of Christ. And on Thursday, the epistles, uh, which we are in First Thessalonians presently. The kids love the Bible classes. They all take notes, and we have Bible drills, and they are so sad when the class is over. The 50 minutes goes by so fast. I'm curious to see how their exams are going to turn out uh, that they will take next week. Please pray, especially for many of the kids in the sixth grade, as they are feeling the pressure of growing up, and many of them have gotten into sin and are on the wrong road. Many of them also do not have good attitudes during Bible class or, or any class, but praise the Lord, that is not the majority. We have been helping and fellowshipping with a national Filipino pastor, Pastor Dio. We are encouraging them to do street ministry, and we just had a great street meeting this past week, and he loved it. We passed out piles of trick track, chick tracks, fellowship track leagues, um, tracks, and preached the gospel through a poorly wired up uh, amplifier run, run off a car battery. Uh, there's a picture of him doing that up there in the top. Uh, people listened and the gospel was spread. Pray for the good results of the Lord's harvest in that area. This paragraph right here like, got me a little bit because Elizabeth was in my kids' class years ago. And so he starts off, he says, our oldest daughter, Elizabeth, just, just turned 13. And I was like, am I that old? And the answer is yes. So, so it's very hard to believe. She has already grown to be respectful, helpful, and a faithful student of the Bible. But as we all know, uh, there can be struggles throughout the teenage years. And we, as all, we always, as parents, want to prepare, pr protect, and guide them through this sensitive time in their life and keep their eyes upon Jesus. This also means that, of course, we are getting old. Uh, it seems like not too long ago, they were just little kids on the street corner with dad or little kids on the deputation trail. Now time is marching on. If you look at the top, uh, so like it says August 2024, issue number 79. And he sends these out every, every month. So 79 months that they've been on this you know, path through their life. It's pretty, pretty crazy. We've also answered prayers if we've been looking for a bigger house to move uh, into, and we found one not too far away. This will allow me to have my own area for an office, my older kids to have their own place for a study in school, and the little ones to be separated uh, with their own little play place and school area. Please continue to pray for Christina in working with the littles. Uh, the olders are, older ones are mostly self-sufficient, but the littles always need a lot of work. Thank the Lord for his care uh, for our little family. Says our little Anna Joy is picking up good on how life works. Uh, the, this, is, this is Brenton humor, for the record. Says recently her mama had walked out of the room and uh, Anna looked and exclaimed, Mama, turn the lights off, you're wasting electricity. She's learning. That's, that's very Brenton humor. So let's pray for, pray for these missionary families this evening. Um, Lord, we are so thankful that we get to partner with the White family and the Patterson family. What a, what a privilege and honor it was to meet Brother Patterson. Lord, I'm so, so grateful that you brought him into our path. I do ask that you would please continue to bless his work in ministry. And Lord, we continue to work through him, through translations and trainings. Lord, we do ask that you be with that children's home in Mexico, that you would please uh, bring the necessary funds to rebuild the building. Uh, you would allow it to be done, done in a very timely manner. Lord, allow us... Allow our church to be a, an influential part in that. Um, and we do thank you, Brother Patterson's mom, Lord, and being so far away from her, I can't imagine what he must be going through. And I ask that you would please be with both of them, bring them encouragement and strength. Um, Lord, I just ask you to be with them through this hard time. I ask you to be with the White family. Oh, Lord, uh, I'm so thankful to hear that they got this uh, new living situation. I ask that you would please be blessed in that, and uh, it would help with the furtherance of your gospel. Um, Lord, I do uh, think specifically of the vehicle troubles that Brother Breton has 
very often on a frequent basis. I ask that you continue to keep his current vehicle in working order. Lord, uh, allow him to, to travel as needed. We're so thankful for the Bible classes that he's been able to teach. I ask that you would uh, be with the students in them. Lord, allow them to uh, understand uh, exactly what sin is and their place in all of that. And uh, Lord, I ask that obviously as Brother Brenton is is such a great Bible teacher and has so much Bible knowledge. Allow him to, to teach on a great level to kids where they understand and see that Jesus Christ is the only way for salvation. Lord, please bless their family. Bless, bless uh, uh, Christina as she homeschools and does so much, so much work there. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, at this time, let's go ahead and stand up and move around a minute, shake somebody's hand. Uh, if... Uh, ushers, if you want to get ready to take the offering, we'll do that right after this. As you make your way back to your seats, let's sing that first verse together. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. All right, you may be seated. Ushers, go ahead and come on forward. A couple announcements to make and remind you of. Uh, Ladies Prayer Brunch is this Saturday at 10 a.m., so make sure you uh, come for that. Anything special this month, Miss Nadine? No. I think she said she's having Joyce Myers coming in for each. And so, okay, yeah. <laughs> we're going to cut that from the live stream part. Okay. No. <laughs> so, so I'm going to yell that. It's okay. So, pastor's done preaching, right? I'm really tempted to have Peyton turn the live stream off right now. So, pastor is preaching. Preached a great message, and he preached. Um, uh, the last point of his message was, "Today's trials are tomorrow's testimonies." 
great, great point. And then somebody from Brother Phyllis Taylor's church found that in like an image and posted it. And apparently that's a pretty well-known quote from Victoria Osteen. <laughs> if I'm not here Sunday, it's because I'm fired, for the record, okay? So... What are the odds he's going to watch it? He's not going to watch this service. It's fine. All right. So speaking of this Sunday, Zonka Sunday. And so, uh, you know, you'll come in this auditorium. It's going to look very different. I'm sure you'll have flags everywhere. going to be a whole lot of orange and yellow going on. Guys, pull out the orange and yellow ties, right? You got those? Everybody's like, no, no. <laughs> so, um, the last announcement I do want to make is this Saturday we do have the Kids Activity Fall Fest. Um, kids are downstairs right now, but the people that are going to bring the kids are upstairs. And so uh, this Saturday from 5 to 8, it's not a very long activity um, compared to most of them that we do. But it's a, it's a fun one that the kids enjoy. Uh, have a bonfire and whatnot for all the kids. Brother Shinneberry, would you lift your voice good and loud and ask the blessing on the offering? My own rope. I'm going to sing in this, but that's just for you. I'm singing in this. Maybe we should have talked about this before. <laughs>
to hear him sing. There'll be a lot of friends waiting when I walk through the gate. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. Thank you, gentlemen. Brother Henniger, you nervous? <laughs> He's sitting in his, his pew over there going. <laughs> How long have you been coming here now, Brother Henniger? I think it's been since August. Of t- well, no, actually before that. I wouldn't even really remember. Since about May of 2022, I think. 22, so a couple years now. Something like that, yeah. He's really been a big blessing. Um, uh, there's been several times where we have had situations where I've had to uh, call him last minute. Like, So if nursing home starts at 10, I've had to call him before at 9 because someone couldn't come, and he's done it on more than one occasion. He's been a really big blessing to our church in more ways than a lot of people know. So Brother Henniger, yeah. have fun. <laughs> You don't know the half of it. <laughs> I'm the person that'll sit, back, they'll sit there in the back at the offering and just try to, when we get ready to take the offering, and try to blend into the scenery and just, you know, I don't know, I just, that way. But this, uh, I really, for some reason, really don't mind this. I like this at all. And uh, I hate to disappoint you, Pastor Steve, but given who's preaching tonight, you really think pastor's not going to watch this video after the back <laughs> to make sure? <laughs> and you think you feel old about a 13-year-old kid? When we were uh, going to Down River Baptist down, down River, our assistant pastor, the man who married Sherry and I, he had two little kids, and we used to watch them in the nursery every so often. Well, recently, I, well, I found her on Facebook, She's grown up, married, and has two kids now. So you talk about feeling old? Yeah. (laughs) And her brother, Gregory, her brother Gregory, he's, uh, he preaches every so often at their church. So yeah, these kids have grown up. So (laughs) you want to feel old, that'll, that'll, that'll definitely do it for you. That'll definitely do it. When you see people you used to, or kids you used to babysit, and they're all grown up now, and have families of their own. It's just like, where is my wheelchair? Man, I got to sit down. <laughs> anyway, and before I go, I wanted to uh, start and just tell you about some blessing we've had recently. I mean, I'm sure you've noticed that that old Toyota ain't riding around here anymore. We had always planned like we were going to get rid of it. You know, after we got it paid down a certain amount, trade it in, and get, it just, get a different car, because it's been about five or six years we've had it. So we started looking around on Carvana for it, and we found a couple of them, you know, 65,000, 75,000 miles, same kind of car that one is. And we just, you know, every time we tried it, well, this isn't going to work out, this isn't working out this time, you know. And then we found this one, and we started all over again on it, and we realized, well, wait a minute, where's the title? Where's the title of the Toyota? We don't have it. <laughs> so we're looking around for it. And I'm thinking, the last thing I remember seeing it was on a folding table I had on my desk in the apartment. And I probably threw it in a bin, which is in the back of our t- attic right now. So I figured I was going to get it. So I got a hold of the ally, and I said, well, I need a copy of the title. Can you get that to me? And I called him on a Thursday. This was before the 12th. We were going to be scheduled to pick it up on the 12th, the Saturday. Oh, sure, 24 hours, we'll have it to you. 24 hours came and went, no title in my, in my inbox on their website, nothing there. So I called them back, and I said, well, yeah, we're really going to need this because I don't have a title. If somebody has, you know, challenges us on it, we got no way to prove we, got to go. we own the car. And I went through this, talking to this guy again, and I said, well, okay, yeah, we'll do it. We'll get it for you in a couple hours, two hours, nothing. So we had to cancel picking it up Saturday, and they said, well, we can hold it for you till Monday at 5.30, but then we've got to unlock it, and anybody else can be open to buy it. So now I'm really steaming. <laughs> and I'm laying in bed that night, 
And I'm thinking, oh, I got to really lay into these people tomorrow or Sunday. I mean, this is just getting ridiculous. And I'm, I'm thinking, and it's really angry thoughts. And I'm thinking, I'm going to call these guys. Well, look, if you don't get this title to me before Monday, you're not getting another dime out of me, pal. Just, you know, face it. <laughs> and I, it got me really worked up. And then we came to church on Sunday and Pastor Summers preached that sermon. And I believe the whole gist of it was it got me was that you just can't rat, lash out at people the way you want to. You can't, you know, just let your anger fester and just, you know, say whatever you want, do whatever you want to people because you're a Christian. You're one of God's children. You can't act like that. So I, I said, well, yeah, <laughs> you got me with that one. So we went home, and I figured, well, I might as well start, pulled out the door for the attic, started to look through it, pulled a couple things out, and I noticed I had a little box that we got from her brother Tom's house. It's kind of shaped like this, only it's about this big. And I thought, you don't think. So I went over, I got it, and I opened it up, and there was the title for the car. No. Right there, all the time. And I think it was just the fact that I was getting so worked up about it and getting angry, and God was saying, well, you know what? You really need to repent of that. And then I go home and look for it, and there it is. We got on their website, we downloaded it, that helped move things along, and we ended up with the car. So praise God, I mean, it's just amazing. And I, I could go on with a few other things like that that just has happened that you wouldn't imagine that the answers to prayer that God has brought. It's just amazing. And, it, and sometimes how we get in the way sometimes of what God wants to do just by our behavior, it's, it's amazing. But anyway, I wanted to talk about that too because... Well, you know, given I'm following Brother Toller, you got to have a funny story. And this car's got all this, this car's got all that electrical stuff on that thing. It's got an owner's manual, but it's on the car, it's on the touchscreen thing. And you, so you got to like sit in your car for what, two hours to read the owner's manual? Seriously. But anyway, this is how it, it's a good idea to know how to operate your car. There was this guy many years ago, a chauffeur for the governor of Tennessee, something like that, way back, I mean, late 40s, early 50s, and he liked driving these straight shift cars. That's all they had back then. And, you know, this is back when the governors were pretty, still pretty country, you know. They have cows out on a state house lawn grazing and stuff like that. I mean, there's dignity in the South, but it's cool and serene, you know. So this guy loved driving these cars for the governor, and when he didn't, he'd be out in the motor pool just kind of sitting around, drinking RCs, eating moon pies, things like that. Well, then eventually, one day, they did like they're trying to do now with EV cars. State decided they were going to get automatic transmission cars. And this guy thought, hey. So he goes down there one day, and he's checking his car out. He gets it going, takes off with it, and comes back about 45 minutes later with that car tore all to pieces. State Commissioner Highway says, L.C., what'd you do to that fine, brand-new car? He said, I broke it. He said, how in the world did you do that? He said, well, I got in the car because I, I don't know nothing about these automatic transmissions, and I was looking it over, and I'm looking at the indicator, and I saw this N on there, so I figured that must be nothing. So I put the indicator in the N and started it up, and looking around, I saw an L there. So I figured that must be the leap. So I dropped it down the leap. Man, it took off. So he says, I'm driving along. This guy pulls up behind me. I figured he wanted to drag, so I just stuck it up into D. So now, so now all of a sudden I'm going along 75, 80 miles an hour, and this guy, I look at my rearview mirror, and this guy's pulling up behind me. So I just shoved it up into race. <laughs> it helps to know your car. Anyway, turn, turn your Bible to the epistle of 1 Peter. We're going to look at a, a few things here in First Peter. And, you know, it, it goes without saying that it's, the Christian life is hard. But like in this instance, when these, uh, Peter wrote this, the, the Jew, Jewish Christians especially were really experiencing a lot of uh, persecution. Now, 
a lot of the imperial persecution from Rome wouldn't really come into full play until like late, late first century and the beginning of the second century. But in the local areas all through the centuries, the Jewish Christians were being persecuted for their faith because they left what everybody thought was the way to go. And they were going, they were having a hard time with it, just like we can experience today. I don't know if we get it yet, as much like they got, but they got, we still get it in, a way, in a ways like that today too. But anyway, pa Peter is writing this letter to them to try to encourage them. And he's talking to them in the first few verses about how their faith and how they should be greatly rejoicing even in that time, knowing that through manifold temptations, there is a, their faith is going to be tried like gold. And they're going to come out the other end better than when they came in. And then they, that, that, they, uh, that their praise and honor will be to the glory of God when Jesus Christ comes and they see him again, who they love even though they haven't seen. It's like what Thomas told Peter, or uh, Jesus told uh, Thomas, he said, you've seen me and you believe, but blessed are those who haven't seen and believe, and that would be these people. And that they, at that time they received the end of their faith, which is the salvation of their souls, our salvation, which the prophets have talk, had talked about, but they never really, I don't know if they understood exactly what it all entailed, and that angels want to look into because they don't understand it either. You figure these mighty angels who have all this power and they have, in the presence of God every day, praising him and worshiping him, and yet this stumps them. They can't understand it. And someday they will probably, you know, maybe when we're all together, but yeah, they, they just don't seem to understand it. So anyway, he's going through all that and telling them about that. Then he comes to the verses that we're going to be looking at, starting in verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourself according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for this opportunity, Lord. I just pray that you'd be with me in everything I say, Lord, that nothing would be done that doesn't give honor and glory to you. Bless this time and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as I was saying, in, in, we're living in an era now that, well, it's been going on for like quite a while now where people want to go by more like what they feel. And I mean, that might sound good to some degree, but in the Christian life, that's not such a good thing because, I mean, you can't always go by the feel, how you feel, because, I mean, there's days you wake up, oh, church, I don't want to go to church today. But, you know, you, ha you, do, you want to because that's where your Savior is and that's where your blessings are. But still, you can't go by your feelings, but it seems like nowadays... You know, everything everybody does is they have to, oh, I feel like this way is the right way, or I feel like this. I remember reading a book by one of my favorite authors talking about how he was um, teaching in a seminary class, and he asked the prop, put a proposition out, and he asked the student what he thought. Well, let him tell me what you think about that. And the man answered, well, you know, I feel that that is, and he said, no, 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 I didn't ask you how you feel. I asked you how you thought, what you thought about it. You need to think, yeah, you need to think about these things and you need to get past what is put out today because you can get fooled so easily by what you see. I mean, we're living in an age where you've got people left and right, and I mean, do I need to mention like Benny Hinn and guys like that, Creflo are just diluting the gospel into something else. There's another thing I tell you. We think we got a, on the car, they got a Sirius XM radio satellite thing. They gave us a little schedule with all the shows on it. They had two, cat, one category was Christian. And there's three channels, and it was like contemporary Christian, then something with Kirk Franklin, and then there's Southern Gospel. 
Then they had a religion section which had two Catholic stations, something else, and I think it was Billy Graham, the Billy Graham channel, which was good. You know, I guess, you, depending on how you feel about Billy Graham. Then there was one, Messages of Hope with Joel Osteen. That wasn't under either one of those. It was under entertainment. <laughs> so I think the people with Sirius XM are onto something there. I think they got that guy figured out. But anyway, like I said, we've been living in an era where people want to go more by how you feel. And it's been said that, yes, you can know Jesus in your head and not have him in your heart. But it's also true that in order for him to be in your heart, he's got to go through your head. It's like any other relationship. I mean, you just don't go out and run up to people and make friends with somebody you don't even know. You want to get to know them, and that's where... Thinking and reading the scriptures comes in, the hand, comes in handy. And that we really need to keep on that and focus on that. And here, you know, we see Peter fulfilling what Jesus had commanded him in John, in John chapter 21. And he said, Peter, Peter, feed my, well, he said, feed my lambs and feed my sheep twice. And now the first and the third time that he says that, the word for feed in the Greek is a word that refers to feeding and nurturing. The second time, it was more of shepherding and protecting. So this is what he's doing here with these people. He's trying to protect them and give them something to do, something they can do. For when these trials come, they'll be able to hang on and they'll be able to persevere through what goes on. So the first thing he says, gird up your loins. Now, most of the times when you see this, it's talking about somebody going into battle. You've got to really... You, they all wore those long robes, and you can't run into battle when you've got stuff around your feet. You know, you just have to tie that stuff up so you can get, you know, get going and be not fall. And I think that's the same thing we need to do today when we go out every day. We need to get ready and gird up our minds for what battle we have. And the best way to do that is through reading the scriptures every day. And he, here in Timothy, uh, in 2 Timothy, Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I was like, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more godliness. And an ag <coughs> excuse me, a modern day example of that would be, and this really aggravates me because I see it every so often, people on Facebook talking about how, oh, we don't use screens, we use hymnals. We're just like, you know, like that is something big to brag about. I mean, I might have said something like that 20 or 30 years ago, but tell you, at 66, I really like that big screen. It's, it, it really makes things easy to see because my eyes don't always function that good in the morning. But I mean, really, if you're going to pick at something, you're going to pick at something like that. I and mean, that falls under the vain babbling, I believe. And then in the next, then um, one chapter later, after he says that, he tells you why you should be reading the scriptures every day. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, for instruction in righteousness, which if you keep that going, is a way to get through trials in your life. When things come your way, you can get through that just by keeping up on reading your Bible. And I know people like read through the Bible. I think in the last ten, five, six years, I've read through it cover to cover about four times maybe, but I found that if you're working still, like you know, when I was working... Um, Sometimes things don't always work that good in the morning. You get running behind. And if you're trying to follow a schedule, sometimes you can fall behind. And then you're trying to catch up the next day. And I know, at least with me, I ended up just reading words. Going word for word. And you, get, you see the words, but they're not connecting. You know, you're seeing, you're seeing the words, and you're seeing basic things, but it's not connecting. So that's one thing I, I really don't follow, trying to follow a schedule like that anymore is because if you get behind trying to be, you, you get crazy trying to catch up. I found 
a better way that um, I try to follow. You still read the Old Testament, but if you go, if you're going to read the New Testament, there is a way I've heard about doing it, and that's take a book like First John, that, and that's a good good book after uh, you know Pastor Claude was talking about love being a test. Read the book of First John. It's five chapters every day for a month. Taking notes, you know, writing questions down. You have questions, you can ask Pastor Steve or Pastor Summers, and they can help you out with it. But just read that book every day for a month, and by the end of the month, you're going to pretty much have that book mastered. I mean, it'll it'll give you a good handle. I mean, you may not get everything yet, but it's going to give you a good handle after a month of reading it. I know I did that. I had a Schofield Reference Bible when I did that the first time. And I mean, I, I, people would mention a verse and I could go right to it and know right where it was on the page. You know it's so good. But yeah, just do that regular, you know, Old Testament reading too, but just really dig in and study on that. And then if you go to a bigger book like, say, Matthew, that's 28 chapters. You can break it up into seven chapters. Read seven chapters for a whole month. and they go, it, it may take you a little longer. I mean, you're not going to get through the Bible in a year. But you're going to have a great grasp on what that book is saying, better than if you just was trying to read all through in a year. And it, it really works for me a lot better than doing it like that. And he says, Paul also said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Even in the Old Testament, they emphasize what knowing the law was. In Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Also, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, 18 to 21, it says, Therefore shall ye lay up these, wor my, these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house, and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children, and the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, to give them as the days of heaven on earth, uh, heaven upon the earth. So again, even in the Old Testament, they emphasize knowing what the law said to keep you in that way. Now, with everything in the law, it was hard to keep everything, which is why they had the, the uh, sacrifices. But still, keeping that law in your mind keeps you straight so that when something happens, you know that if you follow it, you're still going to end up good on the other end. It may be bad for a while, but... God sees you through that. The Puritan writer Richard Rogers once said, in a book he called um, Holy Helps for Godly Living, talking about preaching and reading of the Word and how they're connected. He says, in addition to all I have said, the true Christian by his ordinary hearing is taught to give some of his time to reading the scriptures and other good writers, as is said in another place, and with this good fruit, understanding, and comfort. Without the public ministry of the word, the Christian is likely to neglect and become weary of the labor of private reading and instead give himself to idleness or vain activities. Yeah, I know how that is. So, yeah, and when you're pre, and when you, you hear Sunday and went, not Sunday night and Wednesday night, and you hear pastor preaching, you'll hear things, and he, he, sometimes I'll get a, one of the verses will stick in my mind, I'll think, huh. I'm not checking that, looking at it a little bit more. You know, and that's what the public, part of what the public preaching is, is so that it will get things in, like this stuck in your mind and that you will, it encourages you to go read the Bible every day. Uh, but also he says, he has another, um, let's see, another comment here, let me say about that. However, he also states, ministry of the word is less helpful without private meditation and reading. In other words, Yes, you can get a lot out of the word from public preaching, but it needs to be backed up with private reading. He says, so, however, he, oh, that's, I already did that. 
How, for example, coming to church, the only way many know of serving God, cannot do that good to the best Christian, which is to be over, which is to be looked for, if it is not accompanied with the private helps. This is because hearing the word read and preached does little profit when it is not joined with preparation to hear reverently and attentively, and when it is not afterward mused upon or discussed with others, as occasion may offer, and if private reading is not used. Staying in God's word can help us every day and through every trial. So that's what Peter is saying here. He's encouraging them to gird up the loins of their minds and just stay focused. Stay with the law. Stay with what God says, and you'll get through. Then he also says to be sober. Now, in some cases, this is, again, referred to abstinence from wine, but in this case, I don't think it's referring so much to wine as it is just being discreet, not giving to outrageous behavior, which I think there's enough of that going on today as it is. So, uh, and just... Think about what you're doing before you do anything. You know, always there was a a movie, what was it, the first, yeah, Batman Begins, Christopher Nolan's first Batman movie. There was a moment when he's training Bruce Wayne, and they're outside, and he's fighting him, and he gets him out on on an ice, on a, a frozen lake, and he trips him up, and he says, you need to be mindful of your surroundings which is, I think, a good, a good advice sometimes. You know, when you're walking through this world the way it is today, just to be mindful of where you are, of what situations you're in, that can alleviate a lot of problems, around the people that are around you. And just, you can tell by certain situations, I mean, I can remember going through high school, when I was in the Navy especially, I wasn't exactly following the Lord that closely then, but there would still be times when guys would be going, yeah, we're all going to go over here, come on, let's do this. And, you know, you, they want you to go, and you're just like, no, there's that thing inside of you that's just saying, no, don't, don't even go there. That, I believe, is, was just, I think, what I had growing up and all the, the uh, Sunday schooling and being saved and everything and just all the learning I had had to them was there. And the Holy Spirit was just stopping me and just saying, no, you don't need to be there. And more often than not, it turned out that I was good that I wasn't. Because, you know, people, especially, you know, back then it was one thing. But now, it'd be, cra- it'd be crazy. I don't even... I don't even know how these kids they handle it. They can, you can fall into a situation so fast now, and if you don't have something steady, if you don't have the word of God in your heart, it's easy. It would be easy to fall into a trap that you know you may end up not getting out of. And he says, and he also said, but in the end of all things, but he tells them that too. But the, the end of all things is at hand. Be sober and watch unto prayer. Now that, I think Hannah was here, so I'm going to throw out one of my Greek words here, is sophronio. I think I got that right. But that means be of sound mind, which is, you know, a little bit different from being discreet. Not only watching what you're doing and where you're going, but also not giving yourself free reign and letting your thoughts run wild. And I mean, if you see things like you see things online and you see things on Facebook, you should know right offhand, okay, I don't need to see that. And you just need to get out of it right away. Just get away from it right away. And beware of all at all time. And hope. Now, this is where it, I, this is the part I really liked about this. The hope that we have. It's the Greek word. Elpidzo. And I looked this up. And you talk about having hope. Like, well, I hope we can go on a picnic tomorrow. I hope it doesn't rain. I hope tigers win. I mean, I hope the lions win. But those are all subjective hopes. In other words, it's a hope that depends on something else outside of you. The word that is used here for hope that I just gave you is talking about a hope that is not subjective. It's a hope that doesn't depend on outside circumstances because it is founded on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
It's not something that's going to change. It's not something that's going to go away. It's something that's solid. It's something that is not going to perish. It's just, it's always going to be there. It's going to be there for us at the end. And it also says that uh, in, in here, in, he also talks about what we're going to have in verse 4. When we go back to verse 4, they're going to have, he reminds them of an inheritance incorruptible and done and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. In other words, again, that that fadeth not away is a word that says it's completely secure. Nothing can ever happen to that hope. Nothing can ever happen. That's the same word that gets used in uh, 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So everything God promises us is good. It's solid. It's not going to fade away. Now, like so much in this world today, everybody works and strives for more money, for more prestige, more power, more of this and more of that. But all that stuff is going to go away. I mean, it's like the car we had. We had five years. It's starting to fall apart. Cars fall apart. Homes fall apart. Our bodies fall apart. But... This, what we have here, this hope that we have, is not ever going to fade away. It's going to be there from now until the Lord comes back or we pass from this life through death. It's always going to be there. We don't have to worry about somebody coming to take it. We don't have to worry about it being rescinded. Nothing's going to happen to it. It's solid and it's going to stay there. And how secure is it? Those who are kept by the power of God, and that's another word that is in that in the, in the verse after that, in verse five, who are kept by the power of God through set faith unto salvation. In other words, that is something that is guarded or preserved by God. So, and nobody's going to take that from Him. So, everything we got is safe in God, safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is secure. Then it also states in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 and 19, that by two mutable, and by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay a hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. An anchor. Now, I was in the Navy, and I was on... The aircraft carrier, and you want to talk about some big anchors. Those things are huge. I mean, if you sat in here, it would probably reach to the ceiling. That's how big those anchors are. This anchor for our soul is even bigger than that and more solid than that. And it's not. it can't be melted down. It can't be rusted out. That anchor is there forever, and that is our anchor through times of trial, through times when things don't go so good. This is the anchor we have to hold on to. Paul also said in Romans, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, one, no, first time we went to uh, Phoenix to visit Sherry's brother, we were listening to the preacher, they, uh, their pastor, and he mentioned this verse. And for some reason, this thought popped into my mind that the exact reverse of that is true. It's that all the wealth, All the fame, all the money, all the fun you can have in this life is nothing compared to what we have waiting for us someday when we get to heaven. I mean, think about the greatest, guys, think about the greatest Super Bowl party you can go to, even if it's in Detroit. It doesn't matter. It's not going to match to what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ waiting for us in heaven someday. It's just, it can't be compared. Nothing can compare to that. Then he goes on to say, As obedient children, not fashioning yourself according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as which he has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And we all know, we've all had obedient children, right? Yeah, no, I don't think so. Anyway, we, we try to be obedient children, but, you know, we still in this flesh, it's a struggle. But having the word of God in our hearts helps us through that. 
we keep we keep going and prayer. I should have mentioned that too. I keep that and prayer, and that can keep us through a lot of time. And we need to just watch out for things because there's a lot of things in this life that, you know, pastor was preaching about liberty a little while ago, and there are some things, you know, that you can do, or like some people don't like to go to movies. You know, fine, you know, that's good. Some people do go to movies. I do if it has somebody in a superhero outfit or a minion. That I can, I can, that's about the only things that get me into a movie theater now. But anyway, there are, you know, they're just things. And Paul said also in Romans that I know and am persuaded of the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in and of itself. So, you know, there are going to be some things. However, on the other side of that, when you're talking about liberty, is the fact that you can't force this on other people. You know, just because you think something like going to the movies isn't bad, that doesn't mean you've got to go badger somebody else and say, well, it's no, it's no big deal. You could come on, because you're getting that person to violate their conscience. And that is dangerous. Because when the person does that, and then, you know, they find out nothing happens, what are they going to do next? What boundaries are they going to put in that push nest? And you can ruin somebody trying to do that. We're not that we're not even called to do that. That is not what we're going to uh, supposed to do there. If you have liberty in something, fine. But like it says, it said at the end of that verse there. But for him who considers it unclean, it is unclean. You know, let them live by their scruples, and you keep yours your way. So let me just finish this up today because we talk about hope and we talk about reading the Bible and some people don't understand what that hope, why we hope in that. They don't understand what this is all about. Well, they don't understand because they don't understand the problem. And the problem was after creation. God created all things and gave Adam and Eve everything to enjoy except one thing one thing. And you know when you tell a kid something, one thing you can't, you can do everything but that. That's exactly where they're going to go. But Satan lied through the serpent, lied to Eve and challenged the authority of God by saying, you will not surely die. He's challenging God's authority in God's word. So that was the problem. Sin entered the world. And then If you look also in the second verse in chapter 1, there's the word of Peter. The the word foreknowledge is there. And that is the word, I found this interesting. That is the Greek word prognosis. And that means that that is a forecast, especially of a disease or situation. So we had a problem. God had the forecast, sin. Now that sin was sin in the world, the prognosis was death. The day you eat, because God said, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. The soul that sins, it shall die. And the wages of sin is death. So we had a problem in the world, and then God gave the prognosis that death was the result of sin. But fortunately, he also had the prescription. And the prescription that solved all that was the second person of the Trinity would give up his glory and give up everything he had, all the prestige and honor he had in heaven, all the glory and all the praise of the angels. And he came down to take on flesh to pay for our sin debt so he could solve this problem and end it, end it for those who would follow him. So that's what we've seen the problem, and we've seen the prognosis, and we've seen the prescription, and that is what we have hope in. Nobody understands it because they don't read God's word like we do. They don't have that to hold on to like we do. But it's not hard to get. All you have to do is pray to the Lord that you're a, admit that you're a sinner. And he will accept you into his family, just like everybody else. And that ends that problem.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for this chance to be with, open your word with these people, Lord, and just brothers and sisters in Christ. I just ask that you be a, with us this day as we go home, be with Pastor while he's preaching out, out in Ohio, and keep him safe as he travels back. Watch over and protect us as we leave from here, Lord, until we come back again at the appointed time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you want to stand together, you want to head to the back. The prayer list are on the back table. The kids are already in the foyer ready to come in. And so in just a couple minutes, we'll gather around the altar and pray over these requests together.